أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate, pure progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajallahu Ta'ala Farajah, may God hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Qul ibadi al Ladina Amanu. Say to my believing servants to establish prayers. Sadaqallahul Aliyul Azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There is no worship greater than salah, establishing prayers. It represents the daily connection between the created and the creator, between the slave and the master, between us human beings and the Almighty God. Indeed, pillar, salah, prayer is the pillar of faith. As salatu amudu din. If our salah is accepted by God, Hadiths indicate that other acts will be accepted by God. But if God rejects our prayers because we've neglected them, then other acts may not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah plays a fundamental role in the life of every believer, of everyone who seeks Closeness to the Almighty God, the satisfaction of the Almighty God. Anyone who seeks to elevate his spirituality, to elevate and cleanse his soul. Unfortunately, you will find that in most societies around the world, prayer is neglected. A big portion of the population, they don't even pray. There are many Muslims who don't pray. Millions of Muslims. And even those who pray, they are neglectful of their prayer. They are not aware of the significance and importance of their salah. They do not do justice to the prayer that God has prescribed for them. Prayer is neglected in our societies, in our communities, in our daily lives, in our homes. Many of us, we pray like robots. It's just a routine. It's just a burden that I have to get out of the way. It's nothing more than that for many of us. In order to understand the significance of prayer and to better interact with our salah, to have the salah bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've dedicated a series of five lectures on the importance of salah. So we can come closer to this act of worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has treated with so much importance and significance. In our discussion tonight, which serves as an introduction to this series, let us examine the history of prayer, number one. Number two, in the religion of Islam, when was prayer made mandatory for Muslims? And number three, why do we need formal prayer? Why is it that we need to pray every day? This formal way of praying. Let's begin by examining the history of prayer. When you look at human history, you will find that prayer is an inseparable part of human history. Many anthropologists believe 
that the earliest intelligent human beings used to pray. When we examine historical records, for example, that go back to 5,000 years ago, we see that prayer was central in almost every society. Human beings, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the capacity to use their intellect, they've been worshipping. We cannot isolate prayer from our history, the history of our ancestors. It was prevalent in every community and in every society. Now yes, some communities they used to worship different beings than other communities. Many of them deviated from worshipping the one God. But we see the idea of worshipping and praying was always there. It was a, an integral part of our human history. Therefore, we see that prayer was a fundamental message of every prophet. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet Adam السلام, to this earth, prayer had a central role. Let's take a quick look at the prophets of God and we'll see that prayer existed in all of their lives and their messages. Prophet Adam السلام, the first modern human being, the father of human beings, the first prophet of God. When he came down on earth, on the first day that he came down to earth from heaven, the Almighty God made it mandatory for him to pray 50 prayers, 50 salah, in the afternoon, at sunset, and at night, at the time of Isha. So Prophet Adam السلام, on day one of him being on earth, he had to pray 50 prayers, 50 salah. We have to pray five, but it was obligatory on him to pray 50. That's Prophet Adam السلام. Come to Prophet Idris السلام. Prophet Idris was one of the early prophets of God. He used to pray in Masjid al-Sahla, which is close to the city of Najaf. He used to pray there in that mosque, and he used to sew and tailor garments. That's how he made a living. Because all prophets of God, they used to work. They would not go to people and beg them for money. They used to work with their own hands. Prophet Idris... He would sew clothes, he would tailor clothes, and he would sell them, and that's how he made a living. He would do that in Masjid al-Sahla, and he would pray in Masjid al-Sahla. Al-Imam al-Sadiq tells us it's highly recommended. If you go to that area, go to Masjid al-Sahla. It has a long history. Thousands of years ago, Prophet Idris used to pray in this mosque. Seek the blessings of it, and it's highly recommended to pray in it. Come to Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Narrations tell us that Prophet Nuh in his ark, there were windows in his ark. Allah told him as he was making the ark, the huge ship, to create windows in it. So he could tell the times of prayer. The sunlight would reach. He could tell it's day, it's night, what time of day it was for him to observe his salah. If you come to Prophet Musa alayhi salam, when he went to the Mount of Tur or Sinai and he received the tablets, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell him when he received the Torah? Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'budni wa aqim salata li dhikri. O Musa, I am the one Lord. There is no other God besides me. Therefore, worship me and establish prayers for my remembrance so you can remember me. And he came back to the Jewish nation and he taught them how to pray. And subhanAllah, until this very day, we see that observant Jews, they pray three times a day. Morning, afternoon, at sunset. And these are the three primary times that the Quran mentions. You know, there are some Muslims who attack the followers of Ahlul Bayt and say, you combine the prayers and this is wrong, this is bid'ah innovation. The Quran, when mentioning the times of prayer, mentions not five times, mentions three times. 
Establish prayers at the time of noon. At night, Quran al Fajr, and in the morning. These are the three times that the Quran outlines, which tells you that combining the prayer, this verse in itself is proof that you can combine the prayers because the main times are three morning, noon, afternoon, and night. So even till this very day, observant Jews, you see that they pray three times a day. And these are the three primary times. When you look at other prophets of God, for example, Prophet Salih alayhi salam, his community, his society, they challenged him. They told him, if you're really a prophet from God, let's see a miracle. Show us a miracle. He said, okay, what would you want to see for you to believe? They said, you see that mountain? Tell your Lord to bring a female camel from that mountain. And we want her to be pregnant. And the minute she comes out of the mountain, we want her to give birth. SubhanAllah, look at their conditions. Not only do they want miracles, but they want exactly what type of miracle. That's the human being. He's stubborn. These days you'll see some atheists. They come and they reject God. And there is million signs. Every single sign, no, this, that, this, no. They will reject all the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When His presence is visible everywhere. Same thing with those people. He said, okay, what did he do? He prayed and he went into sujood. He placed his head on the ground and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, show them a miracle while he was in salah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed them the miracle, but what happened? They rejected. Even after what they saw, after that miracle, they killed the camel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided these people are up to no good. There's no chance for them at being guided after what they've seen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed their community and their village. All prophets of God, we see that prayer played a significant role in their lives. Therefore, prayer is not an invention of Islam, brothers and sisters. It's been always part of our history. If you want to keep prayer away from your life, you're denying the history of 124,000 prophets. You're denying the history of humankind. In fact, we're denying our fitrah. Our nature, our essential intrinsic nature. We human beings, we've been instilled by God to worship. Anthropologists are really stunned when they look at the history of human beings and their insistence on worshiping. We have this need that drives us to worship God. Why? Why are we programmed to worship God? To worship a higher being. Now some people, yes, they take this and they corrupt it and they let's say worship an idol or something else. However, the need to worship a higher being is built in us. Why? We human beings, we all have the desire to freedom, right? We all would like to be free. We value freedom. For us, the most valuable thing that we have is freedom. And that's why when someone commits a crime, what do you take away from that person? Do you take his money? No. Do you take his house? No. Do you take his car, his iPhone, his tablet? What do you take from him? His freedom. You lock him up in jail because that's the most valuable thing he has. His freedom, you take it away from him. You lock him up. Every human being has this desire to be free. To remove limits, because that's what freedom is, removing limits. Here's the reason why the human being has this historical need to worship God, a higher being. Why? Because when the human being looks at himself, at his life, he realizes that he's surrounded with limits. I'm limited in my time, in my space, in my mental ability, in my physical capabilities. I'm limited. The human being, when he sees this grand universe, you feel so small, so limited, so weak. A small bird that can weigh 200 grams can fly whenever it wants. I can't. Just as an example. An ant that's so small, that barely has any weight. 
It can walk on anything. It could go on a wall up to the ceiling. I can't. When you look at these small little animals, you see they can do functions you can't do. The human being realizes that he's weak. We have this ambition to be greater than what we are. But we're surrounded by limits. We're surrounded by weakness. Once the human being realizes that he's surrounded with limits, boundaries, borders, and weaknesses, he has the desire to be connected with an unlimited being. That's what worship is. That's what salah is. What is salah in one word? It's, connected the li it's connecting the limited with the unlimited. That's why nothing satisfies the soul of a human being like ibadah and worship. Because through worship, you recognize that you have all these limitations and limits. And so you desire to connect yourself with the unlimited being. There is no experience more satisfying than that. There is no experience sweeter than that. And this is really what gives energy to the true believers. One rak'ah of salah. You stand, you feel as if you've connected to the unlimited being. That in itself satisfies your soul. You realize that yes, I'm miserable, I'm wretched, I'm weak, I'm limited. But I have been given this opportunity to connect to something that's unlimited. I tell you, this is the biggest treasure God has given the human being. He's given you the opportunity, you as a weak, miserable human being, He's given you the opportunity to connect with a being that's completely unlimited. That's the source of all goodness. So worship is in our fitrah. It's in our nature. And the one who rejects worship in his life is going against his own fitrah. It's go he's going against his own nature. And this is a great act of injustice for the human being to disconnect himself from the source of all goodness in the universe. The one who doesn't worship God, he loses. Allah has nothing to gain out of it. He's the one who loses. History is an... Prayer is an inseparable part of our history. Now let's come to the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Were the pagans at the time of the Prophet praying, did they have any type of prayer before we see when Islam mandated salah? Yes, the pagans in Mecca, the idol worshippers, they would pray. But the Qur'an describes to us what kind of prayer they had. وَمَا كَانَ صَلَاتُهُمْ عِنْدَ الْبَيْتِ إِلَّا مُكَاءً وَتَصْدِيَةً The pagans, you know how they prayed? Look how they had corrupted prayer to this extent. Their method of praying, they would gather in Masjid Al-Haram. Around the Kaaba, they would sing, clap, dance, and walk naked around the Kaaba. This was their salah. And the Qur'an attacks them. What kind of a prayer is this? You're giving to your God or even your idols. What kind of salah is this? They would whistle, blow, and clap, and that was their form of prayer. Now the religion of Islam teaches us something here, brothers and sisters. We see that in other religions, in many religions, in many cultures, their way of praying involves dancing and music, right? Many cultures, many religions. Well, the observation that we have, we're not being disrespectful to any culture or religion. Islam respects cultures and religions. However, Islam teaches us that when you're worshipping God, the Almighty God, you have to worship Him in an appropriate way. You have to worship Him in a way that does justice to God, in a solemn way. For us to dance and sing, and play the music, and do wild acts, and say we're praying to God, this is not appropriate to the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go and you meet the Pope, okay? You want to go and you have a meeting with the Pope. Are you going to go barge into the Vatican dancing with music? Or that's disrespectful? You have to show respect to the person whom you want to worship. 
whom you want to meet, let alone the king of the universe. If you have a meeting with the president, do you go in dancing with that person? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a very high status. It is inappropriate for someone to worship him like that. Again, we're not attacking any culture or religion. We're just saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a very high status. His status is to be respected. We have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a polite way, appropriate way, in a solemn way, in a serious way. That's how we show respect to our Creator. But for me as this week creation, to dance and say I'm worshiping God, this is problematic. Now this is, the, this is how the pagans used to worship. And by the way, the origin of this is a paganistic belief that if you dance while praying, the idols will be happy. So, so they tried to make their idols happy by doing that. The religion of Islam came and changed that. You worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the proper way. So when was salah in the religion of Islam mandated and made obligatory on all Muslims? It wasn't the first day. It was about seven years after the ba'tha of the Prophet when he was sent as a messenger. Now during those seven years, there were three musalleen in Mecca. Before Allah made salah officially mandatory, there were three people who would pray in Mecca. And I just want you to picture that amazing scene. The, third, the first three people to pray in Islam. Imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam Ali alayhi salam behind him. Lady Khalija behind them. These were the first three people to offer salah in the religion of Islam. And this continued for seven years. They were the only ones who would pray. Because salah was not wajib yet. Now the Prophet didn't necessarily pray the way now we do, you know, the 17 units with these steps and conditions, but the actual salah, bowing to God, praying, doing sujood, the Prophet would do that, even before he became a Prophet. And they would harass them so much, those evil pagans. One hadith tells us the Prophet, whenever he would pray in Masjid al-Haram, for example once, Two men came to his right side, two to his left side. The ones to the right side would clap. The ones to the left would whistle and they would make fun of him to distract him from the salah. Appreciate the salah that you have. For seven years the Prophet was mocked in Mecca. For 13 years, but especially those first seven years. Sometimes he would be praying in sujood. They would get the intestine of the camel and they would throw it on his back. And Fatima السلام, would see those scenes and she would be so disturbed and sometimes she would cry seeing her father in that state. So the first three to pray in Islam were these three. Know where you get your deen from. How you pray. Learn from those three how they used to pray. Learn from Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, how he used to pray. For th seven years he was the only companion who would pray with the Prophet. I'm going to take my salah from others or from him. Do others know how to be, pray better than he does? When since day one he used to pray with the Holy Prophet. Seven years after the birth of the Prophet, in the incident of what? Al-Mi'raj, the ascension. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made salah mandatory on the Muslims. That's when it became wajib. When the Prophet ascended to the heavens, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him that now I'm making salah mandatory on your ummah. Now something very interesting happened. Hadiths in both Shia books and Sunni books, they tell us that when God first mandated salah, how many prayers was it? We now have the five daily prayers. Initially, what did God mandate? 50 prayers. Initially, it was 50 salah. Allah told him, told the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, O my messenger, I am instructing you to tell your ummah to pray 50 salahs every day. The Prophet said, okay. As he was going back, he met Prophet Musa alayhi salam. 
in the Mi'raj, in the Ascension, he met Prophet Musa السلام, Musa asked him, what happened? Tell me about your conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He told him, Allah made salah mandatory on my ummah just today. He told him, how many rak'ahs or how many salahs, not how many rak'ahs, how many prayers? He said, 50. <laughs> Musa alayhi salam, he told him, Ya Rasulullah, let me tell you something. I've got experience with my Jewish nation. They were obedient and they used to worship until salah became wajib on them. They were not that observant with their salah. And let me tell you, your ummah, they can't handle 50 salah. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decrease it. So the hadith says, he goes to Allah, he goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he tells him, Oh Allah, Musa has asked me to ask you to decrease it. Now there's a few observations here. First of all, one of the Sunni sources that narrates this hadith is Bukhari. And you see that those people who accuse Ahlul Bayt السلام, or the followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia, of believing in Shafa'a, this is one example of Shafa'a in Bukhari. Because Prophet Musa, when the Prophet was ascended to the heavens in Mi'raj, was Prophet Musa السلام, still alive in the world? Or was he dead? He had passed away. Yet Prophet Musa السلام, even after leaving and departing this world, we see that he did something for the ummah of the Prophet. He asked the Prophet to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reduce the salah. So he benefited the ummah of the Prophet even after being dead. This is one type of shafa'ah and they tell you it's shirk. Okay, if it's shirk, how did Musa alayhi salam do this shafa'ah for this ummah? Because shafa'ah, what does it mean? Help. That means you ask the Prophet for help, the Imam for help. You have a high status with Allah, I need your help. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help me, not because I directly cannot ask Allah, but because you have a high status. There's a difference between me asking and Rasulullah asking. I, with all my sins, Allah doesn't have to grant everything I ask Him. But the Prophet is sinless. Allah will give him what he asks. This is the first observation about shafa'a. Secondly, some of you may be wondering, wait a minute, wait a minute. These hadiths, first of all, doesn't God know that the ummah can't handle it? Musa has to come up with it. The Prophet ﷺ, he himself, he doesn't know that 50 salah is too much on the ummah. Musa ﷺ has to tell him. What's the answer to that? Yes, Allah knows from the first day, Allah, His plan was five. And the Prophet knew that his ummah couldn't handle 50. This was very clear. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show us human beings the value of Prophet Musa and the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So that every Muslim knows that because of them, Allah lifted the burden from us. So we appreciate them. That's why Imam al-Sadiq he says you should be thankful to Musa. This ummah should be thankful to Musa. Allah knows from day one, but he wants to show us the status of these great prophets. That's a type of shafa'a. Be appreciative of what the prophets and the imams had to offer. In a very interesting hadith, Zayd, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, one day he asked him this question. He told him, my dear father, why couldn't my grandfather Rasulullah just ask God to make it less? How come when Musa asked him, he did? Couldn't he just have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Listen to this hadith. Imam Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, in this wonderful hadith, he tells him, Rasulullah, He's above every prophet. He has a special status. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is so respectful with God. When God tells him something, he does not suggest anything from his own. He doesn't suggest. So if Allah tells me something, even if I know that Allah's plan is different, my nation cannot handle it. He's so appropriate and polite and respectful with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he never suggests anything to God. 
That's number one. Number two, he told him, okay, then why did he later, after Musa told him, if he is respectful, then just don't mention it until Allah mentions it. He told him, no, when Musa asked, asked him, now there is a request from his brother Musa السلام, and it's inappropriate for the Prophet to reject the status of his brother. To reject the request of his brother. Now Musa, Musa is not an ordinary person. He's one of the great prophets of God. He's now asked Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, please do this. The akhlaq of the Prophet, the moral code of the Prophet, dictates that he accepts the offer of Musa You see how it happened? Subhanallah. The great status of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So initially, brothers and sisters, you think five prayers is too much? Initially it was 50. Musa السلام, helped us. The Prophet accepted that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, yes, I accept this. Be appreciative. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made 50 prayers mandatory on us. You could say, well, I'm busy, my life, this and that. Why did God create you in the first place? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ For what? I have not created human beings except to what? To eat, to play sports, to work. Yeah, working is necessary. But is that why God created us? To work? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for one thing. إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ The whole point of creation is for us to worship Allah. That's why He created us in the first place. So yes, even if God would have made 50 prayers mandatory on us. No one has the right to object to Allah. When every breath that you have, every cell that you have is from Him. This whole world is from Him. Every dollar you make, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who gave us all these resources. Even if He would ask 50 prayers from us, that's not too much. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mercy on this ummah. Now narrations indicate, now the Prophet did add something. Even though he lowered it from 50 to 5, Allah accepted that. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala authorized his Prophet to add some rak'ahs. Initially, the five prayers that Allah made mandatory were how many rak'ah? They were 10. Each salah was two rak'ah. The morning was two, Zuhur was two, Asr was two, Maghrib was two, Isha was two. And for several years, that's how the salah was in early Islam. Ten rak'ahs a day. Five prayers, each one two, so ten units. Then the hadiths indicate when Al-Imam Al-Hasan and Hussein alayhim salam they were born, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, to show his gratitude and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sought permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to add seven rak'ahs to the salah. So two were added to dhuhr, two to asr, one to maghrib, two to asha. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala authorized him and he accepted it. And that's why the hadith says, when you have doubts in your salah, shak, you're not sure you're in the third, in the fourth, in the second, in the first, the hadith says, if your doubt occurs in the rak'ahs which Allah initially mandated, your salah is immediately invalid. And if your doubt occurs in the rak'ahs which the Prophet added later, which is the third and fourth rak'ah, then you do not break your salah. You assume you're in the last rak'ah, you finish, then you bring one extra rak'ah. The sahu only occurs in those rak'at that the Prophet added, not the original rak'at that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated. And this is why when you travel, the two rak'ats which the Prophet added, they are the ones that fall. And you no longer have to bring them when you're traveling, with the exception of Maghrib of course. But that has a story behind it, why Salat al-Maghrib remains three and it does not become two. But for Asha, Dhuhr and Asr, why is it that when we're traveling? Because it's difficult, it's more difficult to pray when you're traveling. Why does it go down to two rak'ahs? Because originally the salah was two rak'ahs. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he asked Allah to add seven rak'ahs. Allah authorized him. 
The Imam says that's why when you travel, the original salah is not broken. Only what's broken, what's shortened, the rak'ahs that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, added. So seven years after the ba'tha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mandated salah. That's seven years after the ba'tha and about five years before the Prophet moved from Mecca to Medina. And the Muslims would pray. This is when salah was made mandatory upon the Muslims. Now what is the meaning, the linguistic meaning of salah? What does it mean? We always use this word. Salah means dua. It means to supplicate to God. Now some linguists, some scholars believe that the origin of the word salah comes from Aramaic. In the Aramaic language, salah, the origin of the word salah meant to bow. So it was a sign of worship. Some other scholars, they believe that it was originally a Babylonian word from Iraq which found its way to Mecca, to the Arabian Peninsula, when Prophet Ismail alayhi salam, he migrated to Mecca, and then he established prayers over there. Rabbana liyuqimu salah, in the dua of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he took his family to Mecca. That's how this word came into the Arabic language. So the meaning of salah is dua, it's a type of prayer. It's a type of supplication between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's the best type of dua, the best type of supplication. This is the meaning of the word salah. Now there is one important question here, especially nowadays you'll find people who will tell you, you know what? I don't need to pray five times a day the way you Muslims do for me to have a connection with God. As long as I have a good heart, I can talk to God whenever I want and pray to Him whenever I want. I don't need this formal salah. We hear this objection, right? Many people. I've talked to some people who don't pray. Why don't you pray, Habibi? What's wrong? You don't have time? You don't have 17 minutes to pray? He says, no, the prayer is in the heart. I have a good heart. And I pray from my heart. I don't need to pray and bow down and do wudu and the tasbih. I don't need to do any of that. What is the response to that? Yes, it's true that Allah is closer to us than our jugular vein. When your people, when my servants ask about me, tell them I'm close. I hear you. Yes, Allah is closer to us than our own selves. There's no doubt about that. We can talk to God every day. However, this is a fundamental point. Allah has such a high status, only He knows what His status is. No human being can figure out what the status of God is. Because we're limited, He's unlimited. How can the limited grasp the unlimited? Allah has a status. When you talk to someone, you need to know what their status is. Otherwise, you will be offensive. You have to know whom you're talking to. Do you talk to your kids the way you talk to your wife, your teacher, your friend? No. Each one is different. Because everyone has a special status, a certain status. In order for you to be polite and respectful, you have to know the status of the person whom you're talking to. No human being can say, I know what the status of God is. No. Not even the prophets and the imams. Even though they know God, but that unlimited status, only He Himself, God, knows His unlimited status. No human being knows the status of God. Now, you have to be respectful when you worship God, because when we worship God, we talk to God. How do I make sure that every day I am observing the status of God by speaking to Him in an appropriate way? The only way is for He Himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to tell us how to talk to Him. That's why worship requires a formal ibadah, which is salah. Let me give you an example. Let's say you are very close to your friend. You can talk to your friend about anything. Let's say you want to meet your friend. Do you just go and barge into his house and intrude? Or no? You call him, at least you tell him, hey, I'm coming in an hour. At least you seek an appointment. You want to meet someone, you seek an appointment. 
Once you seek the appointment, you go, you don't break into your friend's house. You go from the door, right? Imagine if you go from the back door or from the window. Is that respectful? He's your best friend. That's fine. But he is in his private room. Suddenly, you break from the window into his room. <laughs> is that respectful? No. Your friend will tell you, look, I know I'm close to you, but respect me. Let me know you're coming. You don't just intrude on me like that. Once you get the appointment from your friend, you go and visit him, then you can talk to him, whatever you want. Feel comfortable, feel at home. Every single day, Allah, to observe his amazing status, we seek five appoints, appointments from him every day. And that's through salah. Once you've done that, talk to him all you want. But if you want to talk to God and worship him, from your heart, without doing the formal salah, that's an offense to the status of Allah. Because you have not given respect to His status. Why? Because salah, there is a reason why we pray the way we do, to respect the, God, the status of God. You know, one hadith says, salah has 4,000 conditions. This salah that you see is so simple, and really it is simple. We pray here every night together. It's pretty simple. But it has 4,000 rules and conditions and limits. One hadith says salah has 4,000 doors. 1,000 mandatory rules and 3,000 mustahab rules. When you pray, you're observing the status of God. You're showing respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you examine salah, what are the acts of salah? In the beginning, you have to purify yourself, right? With wudu. You make sure your hand is clean, your face is clean, your feet are clean. What does that show? That I'm observing the status of God. I'm cleaning myself before speaking to the master of the universe. That's how you seek permission to speak to God. That's how you show respect. When you stand in salah, you face his symbolic house. As if Allah, I'm coming to visit you in your house. The clothes that you have to wear in salah, are they any clothes? Najis clothes, unclean, made from unclean animal? No. Even the clothes that you have to wear, you have to make sure you are wearing appropriate clothing in order to respect the status of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If your clothes, for example, you got them by stealing it from someone, your salah is invalid. Because when you stand before the Almighty God and you've stolen your clothes from someone else, you're disrespecting God. You're violating God. That's why the house that you pray in, it has to come from a lawful source for the salah to be valid. And look at the rules of the salah. On one of the nights we will examine step by step the amazing acts of salah and their significance. The only way for you wretched, hu miserable human being to talk to a source that's nothing but goodness. Remember, Allah has nothing but purity. I as a human being, I'm contaminated with my actions, with my sins, with my physical desires. These all contaminate me. Allah has nothing for but purity. For me to talk to the source of all purity in the universe, I have to worship Him in a way that's appropriate to Him. Once I've done that, you can talk to Him as much as you want from your heart. So don't say, no, I don't need salah. I'll talk to Him whenever I want. The minute you do that, you've disrespected God. You've offended the status of God. It's just like intruding into your friend's home. Seek an appointment from Allah. Be respectful. And salah allows you, brothers and sisters, to be respectful. And it shows us that we're thankful to Allah. Once the Prophet, peace be upon him, he engaged the entire night in ibadah. One of his wives, she told him, Ya Rasulullah, why do you do this to yourself? Your feet are swelling. You don't have to pray that much. You know what he said? Shouldn't I show some gratitude to God? That's the least I can do to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala my gratitude for all the blessings that He's given me. 
When you pray, you're essentially thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you. Salah is pivotal in our lives, brothers and sisters. We need this form of salah. It guarantees us the best link with our Creator. And that's why you'll find salah is so important that it applies in all circumstances to everyone. With all other religious acts, there are conditions. For example, we have to fast on Ramadan, right? But if you're sick, if you're traveling, you don't fast. Who is obligated to go to Hajj? Those who are able, physically able, financially able. And every Islamic act, which is wajib, there are conditions to it, except salah. Everyone has to play, pray, the young and the old, male or female, the rich and the poor, the healthy and the sick. Even if you're paralyzed on your bed, there's a salah for you. You can't do ruku' sujood, there's a salah for you. You can't stand up, there's a way of you doing the salah. In fact, in Islamic law, there is something called salat al gharik Salah is so important, there is a type of salah for the drowning person. You're drowning for God's sake, there's a salah for you. You say three times the tasbih and that's your salah. Even if you're drowning and you hear the adhan, you pray. That's how important salah is. And this is how we see the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam treating their salah. Listen to what Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam He mentions about his mother Fatima. She would pray in all circumstances. He says, I would witness my mother when he was a child. He says, I was witness, I would witness my mother Fatima stand in the midst of the night till the morning. She would be on her feet praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith. It says that, why is Fatima called the Zahra? Zahra means the luminous light. Why is she called that? Because when she would stand in her mihrab to pray, 70,000 angels would pray behind her. And the nur of Fatima alayhi salam, the light of Fatima would fill the entire universe. Yes, it's not visible to our eyes, but for the angels it was visible. And on the last days of her life, on the last day of her life, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she told her maid, Fidda, oh Fidda, when the time for salah comes, when the adhan approaches come, she was very weak, she could barely move. The last day of her life. Come and tell me, when the time for the adhan is. Fidda comes into the room of Fatima al-Zahra and she tells her, Oh my Sayyidati Fatima, it's time for salah. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she gets up to go to pray, but her face was yellow, she had no energy. She got up to go and do the wudu. You know how she would walk? She would place one hand on the wall and the other hand on her broken ribs. She went and she did her wudu. And she prayed for that last time. Yes, even in the most difficult conditions, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam they would not neglect their prayers. Zainab alayhi salam on Ashura at night. Imam al Hussein, you know, he made two requests from her. Oh Zainab, be patient, take care of the orphans. Don't break down before the enemy. And number two, oh Zainab, don't forget me from your salah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, with his greatness, he asked his sister Zainab, Don't forget me from your son. And Zainab prayed that night, all of Salat al Layl, she prayed it on the sands of Karbala, but she had no energy to stand and pray. She prayed it while sitting down. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts for his worship, for his ibadah, for his salah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us in these. In these final nights of the holy month of Ramadan, let's now raise our hands in dua. Let's ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us. Everyone raise your hands in dua. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
اللهم إنا نتوجه إليك باسمك الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله everyone together يا الله 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 اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم اقضي حوائج المحتاجين اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم اقضي دين كل مدين اللهم فرج عن كل مهموم ومكروه اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين لقضاء الحوائج Let's recite this holy verse five times together بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة مسبوقة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد